in Judges 14 tonight. I'm doing this a little different than I've been. It's kind of a topical way. And if you have an outline in your bulletin, I changed the title Friday afternoon. Did you make a slide for it, Mary? No? Okay. New title is The Lion. There you go. The Wife in the Wardrobe. Some of you will get it. Some of you remember that story. All right. The cord seems like it got shorter or something. It's <laughs> I'd be hung up back here. It's not a. I don't have Tourette's if I'm going like this the whole time. All right. The great philosopher Rob Lowe had this to say about the perils of being famous in America. Nobody remembers Rob Lowe? Okay. In today's world, the right to privacy and freedom of the press are on a collision course. Whether you're a presidential front runner, an actor, or head of a TV ministry, if you stay in the public eye long enough, they're going to try to find a scandal. Then he goes on to say, anyone who's lived their life to the fullest extent has a scandal buried somewhere. And anybody who doesn't have a scandal, I have no interest in meeting. You show me somebody who's led a perfect life, and I'll show you a dollard. I wouldn't agree with Rob Lowe, but Rob Lowe would have loved to have met Samson. He was no dollard, and his life was far from perfect. And he didn't bury his scandals at all. Everything he did, he did right up front. In fact, he had enough skeletons to fill two closets and probably enough dirty laundry to keep a laundromat going 24 hours a day. That was Samson, larger than life, a he-man with a she-weakness. He was a hero, a freedom fighter, a troublemaker, a playboy, a miscreant whose life was dedita dedicated to God before he was even born. His story is one of the most amazing, perplexing, contradictory, contradictory, <laughs> bafflements in the Bible. He should have been a godly man, but he wasn't. We wouldn't think that he would have been in Hebrews 11, but he is. Now, last Sunday, we began learning about the life of Samson. I mean, we, we ought to read about Samson more often than we do, because his life is filled with lessons, it's filled with examples, it's filled with applications. Ray Pritchard says, there are three basic reasons we need to study Sam Samson more often than what we do. Number one, because his story is so well known, yet so little understood. In one sense, Samson is one of the best known heroes of the Bible. Right? For generations, little children have heard about Samson, his long hair, and how Delilah tricked, him, tricked to, to get the secret out of him, and how his eyes were poked out, and how he brought down the pillars and killed all those, those Philistines. If you go to church at all, you know about all that, those stories. But the rest of it, we don't really understand at all. What made Samson tick? How could a man start so well and yet end so poorly? How could he forget all the things that his parents taught him? Why did he have such a weakness for women? How did he, how did he end up in Hebrews 11? What did God see in this man? In short, there's a lot more to Samson than meets the eye. A little deja vu from this morning here. <laughs> at least you're not sleep. At least you're not sleeping and you hear it. So, <laughs> where was I? <laughs> Let's go to number two. I think I'm, I think I'm there. <laughs> because number two is because we are like Sa we are like Samson, and he is so much like us. Sometimes we read the stories of men like David or Abraham, and we think, I could never be like them. You know, they seem to be in a different category, as if we should label them special cases, and the rest of us just as regular people. After all, Abraham was a friend of God, and David was a man after God's own heart. Those are great stories, and we profit greatly from reading them, but these men 
those men don't seem very much like us. Not so with Samson. He's a lot like us. My mic's off? No? Okay. Back on now, I think. Many of us know what it's like to come from a godly home. Many of us have entered life with great expectations placed upon us by other people. Most men know what it means to be tempted by women. All of us struggle at times with the desire for revenge. We've been there. We understand. When we see Samson struggling with these things and falling, we know exactly what he's going through. Number three, because Samson is the perfect man for, the, for today. He was a, he's a man that would feel right at home in the 21st century. He'd have a ball looking out for number one. I looked up the different generations, and I found one that I agree with more. That I'm, I'm a, you know, you have the boomer generation. I'm a boomer too. And then Generation X started in 1966. It seems that some from Generation X and a lot from Generation Y and Z and the millennials, whatever is in between there, desire self-fulfillment above uh, everything else. They're materiali materialistic, non-traditional. They're heavily into lifestyle issues. They lack institutional loyalty and crave, uh, uh, they crave a cause to believe in. They will rarely give of themselves and always expect something in return. That sounds just like Samson. Give him some skinny jeans, a BMW, and a smartphone, and he fit right in. CNN would find him interesting or fascinating. The, Car the Kardashians would party with him. Oprah would interview him. Late-night hosts would make jo jokes about him. Kids would hang his posters on their bedroom walls. Somebody would make a rap song about his affair with Delilah. He'd feel right at home in America today. Perhaps more than any other Bible character. Samson is one of us. Before we go any further, let's remember from last week where Samson started. Judges 13 was meant to impress upon us five great advantages Samson had as he stepped on to the stage of human history. Number one, his birth was announced by the angel of the Lord. Number two, his mission in life was declared by God before he was even born. Number three, he was raised by godly parents. Number four, he was blessed by God as a young man. And number five, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. No man ever had so much going for him. Com compare Samson with the other heroes of the Bible. Which of them ever had advantages like this? Samson was probably voted most likely to succeed in his high school class. That leaves only one question. Where did Samson go wrong? Fortunately, we don't have to wonder about this answer. Judges 14 unfolds this tragic story of how a man who had it all, let it all get away. In particular, it re reveals to us seven great mistakes. Let's read verses 1 through 3 of chapter 14. It says, Then Samson went down to Timnah, and saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. So he came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as a wife. Then his father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she looks good to me. So number one, he went to the wrong place. Judges 14 begins this way. Then Samson went down to Timnah. The writer is telling us two things in this little phrase here. First, he's telling us something about geography. Timnah was in the Philistine territory, about four miles south, or four miles from Samson's village of Zorah. To get there, you had to walk down a ridge into the Sorek River Valley and then up on the other side. So it's literally true. Samson went down to Timnah. But I'm going to argue here a little bit that the writer is also telling us about the decline in Samson's spiritual life. 
And this, his very first public act, he leaves the land of Israel for the land of the Philistines. To put it bluntly, Samson left his friends to visit his enemies. Verse 2 informs us that he was more than just a casual, he was more, there, more than just a casual visitor or a weekend shopping trip. Samson went to Timnah and he found a wife. But that was his first mistake. If he was looking for a wife, then he obviously shouldn't have gone to the Philistines. And if he wasn't looking for a wife, he didn't have any business to be there at all anyway. Either way, he shouldn't have been there. By going to Timnah, home of his sworn enemies, Samson is indeed going down. Number two in your outline here, he was looking for the wrong thing. Notice carefully what the text says. When he returned home, he told his parents, I have seen a Philistine woman. And after his father objects, he says, go get her for me. She looks good to me. Literally, the phrase in verse 3 reads, she is right in my eyes. The Bible here is telling us something crucial about Samson. He's a man motivated purely by physical appearances. He saw this young woman. She looked good. And now he wants her for his wife. That's all there is to it. In fact, it doesn't seem like he even bothered to meet her. But why should that surprise us? Samson is a red-blooded young man. His hormones are boiling in within him like a steam inside a pressure cooker. He's away from home. He's away from his parents, away from his family, away from his spiritual heritage. And he sees this good-looking young Philistine girl and he thinks, wow, why not marry her? The only problem is he doesn't even know her at all. He doesn't know her name. He doesn't know who her parents are. He doesn't know if she can cook or clean. Not that that's just the woman's job. I'm not saying that, right? He doesn't know if she has any brothers or sisters, or whether she is musical or mean or messy. He doesn't know if she wants a career or children or both. All he sees is, is this beautiful babe in front of him. The rest of it doesn't matter to Samson. Samson was looking in the wrong place for the wrong thing for the wrong reason, and he found it. But it all, that shouldn't surprise us either. In life, you get what you pay for, and Samson is investing in all the wrong places. Number three in your outline, he rejected godly counsel. The downward spiral con continues, but now... It takes an ominous turn. So far, Samson has made some mistakes, but they're not fatal. But that's about to change. There's this reaction of his parents in verse 3 to the news that he wants to marry a Philistine girl. Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? His parents recognized that marrying a Philistine woman was not in his interest, and they tried to warn him. But Samson would have none of it. Now, there's many things that need to be said about this. For one thing, God has already spoken on the matter. In Exodus 34, 16, and Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 through 4, the children of Israel are explicitly commanded not to seek husbands or wives from the surrounding pagan nations. The reason is clear. If you marry a pagan, what's going to happen? He or she is going to turn you away from God. You're going to start worshiping their idols. In fact, the warning against mixed faith marriages is one of the clearest teachings in the whole Bible. Over and over again, the people of God are warned not to intermarry with those who do not share their faith. I know many Christians, mostly women, who have violated that command. And it's not an easy life. They struggle to win their husbands or their wives over to Jesus Christ and usually, usually to no avail. All because early on, in a rush of emotion, they decided to ignore what God said. I've heard them say, it was a big mistake, the biggest mistake of my life, and please warn you know, the young people not to make the same mistake I did. And that's what I'm doing in this message. message. <laughs> I'm warning you not to do what Samson did. We have some singles in our church, maybe some watching online. 
Some of you are sorely tempted to neglect this teaching, but please don't do it. It's okay to be single. You're all right just the way you are. God loves you, and we love you. You don't have to get married, but if you do, marry someone who loves the Lord as much as you do. Remember, it's better to be single for 50 years than to be married one day outside of the will of God. As the saying goes, it's better to be single than to wish you were. I realize it's not an easy teaching. <laughs> After all, it's the Philistines who always seem to have the money and the power. They have the good looks. They laugh. They smile. They don't seem any different from us. It's only after you get married that you realize the truth. Then it's too late. So Samson rejected the godly counsel from his parents, and in so doing, he also rejected God's counsel. But that was inevitable. When you go to the wrong place for the wrong reasons, looking for the wrong thing with the wrong values in your heart, this is what happens. Always. You end up rejecting the counsel of those who know better. Now there's an interesting addendum in verse 4. Listen. It says, However, his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, for he was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. Now at that time, the Philistines were ruling over Israel. Now some people may wonder if verse 4 contradicts this point when it notes that Samson's parents did not know that the marriage was from the Lord who was seeking the occasion to confront the Philistines? The answer is no. It's not a contradiction. The verse is not saying that Samson was right to marry the Philistine girl. After all, the scriptures are very clear on that point, right? It is saying that God was working behind the scenes to bring about confrontation between the people of God and the pagans. Samson was wrong to make the marriage, but God allowed it in order to bring about something good from it. That doesn't justify what Samson did. After all, he wasn't looking to stir up trouble. He was motivated by lust. So this verse is teaching us something about the providence of God, that he can bring something good out of the stupid things that we do. And praise God that he does. That, however, is no excuse for stupidity. Number four, he continued in a wrong relationship. Skip down to verse seven for a minute and notice what it says. But so he went down and talked to the woman and she looked good to Samson. Evidently, he's not even met her yet before now. But that doesn't matter because Samson here is motivated entirely by her physical appearance. He is hormone driven, not spirit driven. At this point, he's not looking for Mother Teresa or Florence Nightingale. This is the Old Testament version of, hello, I love you, won't you tell me your name? Some of the people remember that song. It fits. One bad move leads to another. And he's going down, 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 down. It all started when he went to the wrong place. His fate was sealed when he rejected godly counsel. So now Samson is out on his own, away from God, away from godly influence, away from his family, away from his friends, away from his past. Just write Proverbs 16, 25 over verse 7. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Samson is all smiles because he's he thinks he's found the girl of his dreams. <laughs> but the smile is not going to last. And the dream soon turns into a nightmare. Number five. He played fast and loose with his spiritual commitment. Let's pick it up in verse five. Then Samson went down to Timnah and his father, with his father and mother, and came as far as vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that he tore him as one tears a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. So he went down and talked to the woman, and she looked good to Samson. When he returned later to, t to take her, he turned aside to look at the carcass of the lion 
and behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the body of the lion. So he scraped the honey into his hands and went on, eating as he went. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they ate it. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey out of the body of the lion. Then his father went down to the woman, and Samson made a feast there, for the young men customarily did this. When they saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. And we'll stop right there at verse 11. Two things here happen, or now happen that point out the spiritual deterioration in Samson's soul. First occurs as he and his parents make their way down to Timnah to arrange the marriage. While they're traveling, Samson turns aside to a vineyard and he encounters a young lion. And the spirit of the Lord comes upon him and he tears the lion apart with his bare hands. Verse 6 notes that he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. That's kind of curious why. You'd think he'd be glad to tell them my deeds like, deed like that. I mean, if I could tear a lion apart with my bare hands, I'd be telling everybody. He doesn't tell them because killing a lion meant touching his corpse after it was dead. That's a violation of the spirit of the Nazarite vow. Remember, number six specifies that Nazarites could not touch a dead body. In handling the lion's corpse, Samson is now becoming ceremonial un ceremonially unclean and defiled before God. But the same thing happens again in verse 9. This time, Samson is traveling alone and stops by the vineyard to revisit the scene of this great exploit. He finds that the bees have built a honeycomb inside of the dried out carcass of the lion. And then stooping down, he scoops out the honey with his hands and eats it, eats it as, he, as he walks along. I don't know why I get an image of Pooh Bear walking around with honey in his hands with it. But, but later he gives the honey to his parents, but he did not tell them where it came from. Why? Because it would, re would force him to reveal that he touched a dead body. That's not all. According to verse 10, Samson made a feast, as was, cu as was customary for bridegrooms. The feast was like a rehearsal dinner or a stag party. The Hebrew word for feast is misteth, which means a banquet, an occasion for drinking, a drinking party. That particular word is used for parties where people got drunk. But number six is clear that a Nazarite was not to drink wine or any intoxicating be beverages. And here Samson is throwing a key party just before his wedding. Now does that mean that Samson took the drink? No but it implies that he may have. Let's take these two incidences, incidences and put them together. Samson the lion and Samson the feast. Both of them are coming very close to breaking his Nazarite vow here. He's living close to the edge. He's pushing the outside of the envelope. The only part of his vow he's clearly keeping is his command to, to not cut his hair. But if he keeps going down this road, that's going to happen too. Samson, at this point, pictures a believer going farther and farther away from God. If you simply look at his long hair, he appears to be dedicated to God. But the lifestyle tells another story. On the outside, he looks like a man of God, but on the inside, he's no different than any other man in the world. And that's what eventually happens when you drift away from God. You start out innocently enough, testing the water, carefully wandering where you don't belong, following your emotions to see where they will lead you, casually going your own way, oblivious to those who would warn you of the danger that's ahead. Eventually, your spiritual commitments don't mean very much. And you end up like Sam Samson, Looking spiritual on the outside, but worldly on the inside. Number six, he couldn't bear to hear the truth. Now the time has come for the wedding here. In order to understand this, we need to know a little bit about the marriage customs of Samson's day. Basically, it started with an agreement to be married. That agreement, called a betrothal, was usually arranged by the parents. The betrothal period lasted anywhere from six months to a year. At the end, there was a 
a seven-day wedding feast. And at the end of the feast, the marriage was consummated. And that's the basic picture here behind Judges 14. We pick up the story in verse 11 on day one of the seven-day wedding feast. So when they saw him, they, th they brought 30 companions to be with him. Let's go ahead and read the on down. Let's just keep going. Then Samson said to them, Let me now propound a riddle to you. If you will indeed tell it to me within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 linen wraps and 30 changes of clothes. But if you are un unable to tell me, then you shall give me 30 linen wraps and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, Propound your riddle that we may hear it. So he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. But they could not tell the riddle in three days. Then it came about on the fourth day that they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband so that he will tell us the riddle, or we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us to impoverish us? Is this not so? Samson's wife wept before him and said, You only hate me, and you do not love me. You have propounded a riddle to the sons of my people and have not told it to me. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told it to my father and mother, for should I tell you? However, she wept before him seven days while, her, while their feast lasted. And on the seventh day he told her because she pressed him so hard. She then told the riddle to the sons of her people. We'll stop there. Samson begins by offering a riddle to the 30 Philistine groomsmen. It's kind of a friendly battle of wits. It's very common in those days. The riddle involved the honey that Samson took from the carcass of the lion he had killed. And the riddle, which is happens to be an excellent example of Hebrew poetry, went this way in verse 14. Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. No doubt the riddle was announced with great fanfare and much amusement, but there was a catch. Samson offered a wager along with the riddle. The, th the gr 30 groomsmen had seven days to solve this riddle, and if they did, Samson, Samson would give them 30 linen wraps and 30 sets of clothes. If they couldn't, then they would give Samson the same thing. The first day came and went, and they couldn't figure it out. Second day came and passed, same thing. S same thing on the third day. By the fourth day, the groomsmen are getting a little nervous. So they approached Samson's bride and made her an offer in verse 15 that she just couldn't refuse. Entice your husband so that he will tell us the riddle or we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Suddenly th things turned a little ugly here. They're not very nice people. They're deadly serious in what they're threatening. The word they use is crucial here, entice or coax. It's the Hebrew word pata, meaning to seduce a simple-minded person, a naive person that can't figure out right from wrong. The Philistines would say the same thing to Delilah some 20 years later. Samson was enticeable because he was all hormones and no brain. He was big, strong, and stupid. Here's the sad part. Samson's, apparent, or Samson's weakness was apparent to everyone but him. His enemies knew it, but he didn't. So his bride uses the number one strategy of brides everywhere. When in doubt, cry. For three days she cried. She wept. And she pleaded with him to tell her the riddle. Finally, the seventh day came, and just before sundown, he told her the secret. Why did he wait the three days to finally tell her? Because on the evening of the seventh day, the marriage would be consummated, and that's what Samson was waiting for. Remember, he's a man driven by entirely by lust, by his flesh. Lust finally overcame his good sense, and he gave in. One other point, when she pleads with him, she makes a telling statement. You hate me. You don't really love me. As a matter, matter of fact, that's true. Right? There's no evidence that Samson truly loved this woman. From the beginning, 
His interest has only been on the physical. He didn't love her. She knew it. And in the crunch, she used the truth, that truth against him. That was a blow to his ego. And he couldn't dare admit that that was true. Right? So to cover it up, to prove that he loved her, he revealed the secret to her. The point is, Samson was a weak man. He's putty in the hands of a cunning woman. She tapped into his ego, and he was quite literally defenseless. Delilah would use the same tactic here 20 years later. And Samson never saw his weakness. He refused to admit that he had one, and consequently, he never came to grips with it. In the end, it would prove his undoing. For the moment, hold this thought in mind. It is often our refusal to deal with our weakness that gets us into most most problems. Gets us in a lot of trouble. Most of us are just like Samson. We will do anything to avoid dealing with the real issues in our lives. It's easier and less painful, we think, to pretend that everything's okay even when deep down inside we know that it's not. Number seven, he couldn't face up to his own stupidity. Pick it up in verse 18. We'll finish out the chapter here. So the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of them and took their spoil and gave the changes of clothes to those who told the riddle. And his anger burned, and he went up to his father's house, but Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his friend. This little episode is almost over here. (laughs) The grooms will now know the secret, and they come to Samson with, with the riddle, at the last moment with the answer. And his reply here is filled with sarcasm. If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Heifer in Hebrew is heifer in English. But now Samson has lost his bet. He has to find 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And here's the solution. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of their belongings, and gave their clothes to those who explained the riddle. That's fine, except that it means Samson had to kill 30 Philistines, right, to pay off his bet. It also means he had to touch their dead bodies in order to get their clothes off of them. Clear violation of the Nazarite vow. But it doesn't matter now. Samson's angry because he's been publicly humiliated, betrayed by his bride, embarrassed by the groomsmen. But what was there to be angry about? He's the one who went to the Philistine territory in the first place. He's the one who picked out this girl. He's the one that decided to marry her. He's the one who thought up the riddle. He's the one who made the bet. He's the one who named the price. He's the only one who knew the secret. And he's the one who gave the secret away. Samson, if you want to get angry with somebody, look in the mirror. The only fool you'll see is the one looking back at you. So he paid the debt off, and he returned to his father's house. But what about his bride? What about the consummation? What about the marriage? Samson leaves his bride standing at the altar, and her father, who's understandably embarrassed, gives her to the best man. He married her, and the story's over. The conclusion here. Empowered but not controlled. It's kind of a strange chapter in many ways. What starts out with lust ends up with anger. In the beginning, Samson wants romance. In the end, he wants revenge. In between, he makes one mistake after another. Samson's basic problem is that he never learned to control his own emotions. Time and time again, they get him into trouble. First in romance, and then and revenge. Samson is the perfect 
picture of a believer out of control. And here's the irony. He was empowered by the Spirit, but he was never controlled by the Spirit. And that can happen to any of us. When it does, we're just like Samson. We're capable of great accomplishments. And we're capable of incredible, stupid mistakes at the same time. Incidentally, that kind of explains how some Christian leaders can accomplish great things for God and yet fall into terrible sin. They are empowered by the Spirit, but they are not controlled by the Spirit. And unfortunately, that happens, I think, a lot more than we, we think. The truth will set you free. John 8, 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, right? The truth shall make you free, but it will hurt you first. Makes perfect sense. The truth will set you free, but it will hurt you first. You know why most people have trouble growing spiritually? It's not because we don't know the truth. We've got so much, so much truth, it's run out of our eyeballs. We hear the truth at church, on the radio, from our friends, from our family, from books and tapes and seminars and concerts, and we get it straight from the Bible. That's not our problem. If just knowing the truth were all that we needed, we would all be candidates for permanent sainthood. We know the truth. The problem runs much deeper than that. We know the truth, but we don't want it to hurt us. So we deflect it. We ignore it. We deny it. We attack it. We argue with it. And in general, we avoid it any way that we can. Our approach is like the USS Enterprise being attacked by Klingons. We put the force field up so those incoming lasers of truth, you know, they get deflected. And after a while, we get so good at deflecting, uh, deflection, the truth just never gets through to us at all. We hear the truth, we know the truth, but we deflect the truth. So it never gets close enough to hurt. Therefore, we're not set free. And that's why we're still angry. That's why we're still stubborn. That's why we're still bitter. That's why we're still greedy. That's why we're still arrogant. That's why we're still filled with lust. That's why we're still self-willed. That's why we're still unkind. We refuse to let the truth hurt us. Are you willing to let the truth hurt you? That's the question. Samson thought he was free, but he wasn't. He was in bondage to his own uncontrolled emotions. Strangely enough, the truly free man is not the man who does whatever he wants. The truly free man is the man who has dared to let the truth hurt him and the process, and in the process of being hurt, he's been set free. The truth shall set you free, but it will hurt you first. For some, that will be the most important thing you hear throughout this series of Judges. Take some time to think about it. That's really probably the most important truth I've heard in the last couple of years. So here's the question again. Are you willing to let the truth hurt you? Whenever you decide to say yes, the words of Jesus will come true for you, and the truth will at last set you free. Let me pray. Father, we, we thank you for your truth. And Father, it is very true. We, we don't want to be hurt. We know our sin, Father. We deflect the truth and we, we, we protect our sin. We don't want people to know things. We don't. We lead double lives. But you always know. It's baffling to me 
And I, uh, I've done it myself, Father, because to care more about what other people think about me and the, my Creator knows the truth. Lord, help us. Help us to be honest above all with you and with others so that you can truly use us. Thank you again for your word, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Have a great night.